Hi there and welcome to Sell, Serve, Prosper Radio. Now this interview is with Henry Aturo, Business Management Strategic Planning at Provectus Management Consulting. Uh, he's a great guy with a great background and I tell you, so many great tips in this interview if you're a leader, manager of an organisation that you want it to grow. Stay tuned and this will really help you sell more, serve more and prosper more. Go for it. Sell, Serve, Prosper Radio with Lee Farnell. Hi, folks. Here we are, and welcome again to Sell, Serve, Prosper Radio. It's Lee Farnell here, and this morning with me is Henry Aturo from Provectus Management Consulting. Henry, thank you so much for agreeing to be on this podcast with us. Pleasure, Lee. Mate, now we met uh, through the CEO Institute uh, and other people, and, mate, your background is fantastic, so I'd like to... um, Set the scene because one, the, uh, Sell, Serve, Prosper is really about helping people in business sell more, serve more, prosper, achieve their goals, um, achieve their business goals, achieve their personal goals, and give them tips and hints and insights. And so I want to, one, find out about you, get inside your head as a business person and your background, and then two, uh, talk about some of the things you teach and coach in so that, uh, again, those tools can turbocharge people's uh, business growth. So, Henry, in the first instance, tell us a bit about your background. Certainly, Lee. I, uh, I was with Coles Meyer for 23 years, and in 15 of those years, I held some senior executive and national roles. More recently, I spent 16 years with Red Dot Stores and grew that from uh, 12 stores to 60 stores to be the biggest privately owned discount retailer in WA. Wow. Um, over the last uh, 18 months, I uh, started my own business, uh, Provectus uh, Management Consulting, and I consult to small to medium-sized businesses in identifying and solving management and business issues, mainly focusing on operational efficiencies. Okay. So that background, as you say, in, uh, in, in, in retail. Uh, look, so just let's start with that. So Coles Meyer, if you're going to say what are three or four key things you learnt in your time at Coles Meyer that – that benefit you now? <laughs> I don't think we've got that much time, but um, right. some of the basic basic principles was, you know, make sure you're taking notes, you know, and, and then action those notes because you just can't remember everything. Um, very disciplined organisation, certainly in the, uh, you know, in, in the days of Coles or GJ Coles. Um, you, it was a school of hard knocks and, and you learn by by making mistakes, you know, it, it, it was a safe environment where if you, you know, if you didn't get it right, you had an opportunity to do it again. And that's where you get your biggest learnings from making your own mistakes, but also watching others make mistakes. Yeah, right, right. And in terms of leadership there, I mean, as I said to you years ago, my, my business partner, Gary Capelli, ran the health program out there at the headquarters of Coles Meyer, And that's where I met him. I was doing the fitness testing for Laurie Potters and we were keeping the executives and the people fit in the gym there. Um, were you there in those days, did you say? Or that I was, was I was, Lee, yeah. So I was um, in Taronga in head office from probably 90, geez, it was 92 to oh, on and off, back to, right up to 2000. Um, I did a stint in New Zealand. I was general manager at Kmart in New Zealand for, uh, for about three years, which was uh, wow. absolutely fantastic, and had a couple of national roles in, in Taronga. But look, uh, it was a, I mean, it's obviously a different organisation today. It's, uh, it's now West Farmers, but it was, it was an absolute juggernaut. And uh, you, learn, you learn from some of the best business people. You know, and, and the skills that you learn, whether it's retail or whatever, they are very, very transferable. Hey, just on that, in terms of leadership, as you say, you would have come across a whole lot of different leaders over that period. Uh, from your point of view, what makes a great leader in an organisation? Some of the ones that you would have dealt with over the years, ones you, that were standouts, what were, what were some of the characteristics and attitudes they had that you said, man, that, that person's a great leader? I found that um, you, know, you, you, you go through a number of CEOs or managing directors over that period, and the ones that that communicated well, I felt, were really good leaders. You know, the ones that actually took the time to to ensure that they met with their, not only their senior executives, but also with the middle managers, you know, with the people that are actually on the ground getting work done and giving them a, a an overview of where the business was going, how the performance was. It, it instilled, if you like, a degree of loyalty and a sense of ownership because you, you felt that you were... Um, you were privileged enough to, to be in the know with the with the MD, and I think a lot of organisations now discount that. You know, 
oh, we don't need to, we don't need to, you know, employees don't want to hear all that. Um, you know what? Yes, they do. They yeah. do because because they want to know that their contribution is making a difference. They want to know whether their contribution is actually having a positive impact on the business or whether they need to do a little more um, to, to, you know, to have a better, a, a better result. And so, you know, don't discount getting in front of your, your, your organisation, whether it's on a quarterly basis, at, at least on a quarterly basis, and giving them a brief update. It doesn't have to be an expensive and, and long, you know, long thing, an hour, and, uh, and just let them know how they're going because they appreciate it. Right, that whole proximity by being close to them, the human being. I mean, at the end of the day, say we're human beings. People, people want to be close and, and hear. And I, we we actually teach involvement equals ownership equals commitment. You want people committed, you got to get them involved so they get a sense of ownership. And your point there also around being valued, mate. We value what you're doing. You're doing a great job. Actually, we actually need to push ourselves more. Or just on that, um, what about those managers that were? never happy uh, do, do they win do you think i mean in the sense of you know they're always pushing um and almost like it can either be fear or you know yeah yeah I, those hear, kind of guys. I hear Lee. there was a lot of there was a lot of that in those days there was that the sort of rule by fear <clears throat> excuse me it was always you know the stick versus the carrot um those days are long gone and and those yep. managers weren't successful they were successful yep. in the short term they got short-term results, but ultimately, the first opportunity, people bailed on them. You know, people people look for alternatives because they weren't happy in those environments. Yep. And, and and those type of people, you know, some of them changed, some of them saw the light, and, and were able to to adapt. And and the ones that weren't, unfortunately, they uh, you know they, it was their own demise. Um, Leadership, we say the speed of the group is determined by the speed of the leader. Now, obviously, when you grew Red Dot from, what, 16 to 60 stores, um, what were some of the, your strategic secrets? What were some of the strategic principles you worked on to, I mean, just getting the locations would be one thing, let alone staffing and systems and and building a sense of team in in that growth spurt. So what, what, what would you say, what are some of the secrets you use there? Um, Lee, you, you said something that really resonated. The speed of the uh, team is, depends on the speed of the leader. Uh, be very, very wary. I fell in a trap on a, on a couple of occasions where, you know, lots of energy, lots of enthusiasm and passion. And so you're off at 100 miles an hour. Um, you look you look back and there's no one behind you. You're right. Um, you know, you've left them for dead. And, and then you find yourself, you know, the whole host of other issues because you can't do it on your own. So... You really need to get your team fit. You know, before you start running with your team, you need to get them fit. You need to get them engaged. You need to get them committed, um, and also and also up for the challenge. So, so the key is in in in, in preparing, sharing, preparing, and making sure that you're bringing them along on the journey. Now, what will happen is, and 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 I. Uh, and I live by this, and it might not be politically correct what I'm going to say, Lee, but I'm going to say it anyway because this is this is the way I manage. You carry the wounded and you shoot the stragglers. Oh, so wow. the ones the ones that, that are trying really hard, they might be they might be under the pump, they might be suffering a bit. Support them, help them, because they're going to stand by you in the trenches when the times get tough. Yeah. The ones, excuse me. The ones that um, that just lag behind and just you know dawdle and and, and really drag the chain. Like you, you've got to do the kind thing and leave it. Carry the mind. wounded, shoot the stragglers. I like it. Yeah, uh, it's not very politically correct these days, but I've got to tell you, if you stand yeah. by it, you, you know, we, we can change the terminology, but yep. the principle's the same. And, and and the thing is that, you know, we've got to be we've got to be caring, we've got to be humane in these things, and, and if people just don't want to be there or they're the wrong fit, what can we do to support them to transition into something that will fit for them somewhere else? You're right, right. So, so just on that, coming back to meetings, how you engage. Let's just even talk about that piece at the front end. How do you get them fit? What were some of the things you did specifically to get them fit before they went on the journey? One of the things, one of the things that um, that really uh, worked for me, particularly particularly in Red Dot, was making sure that you have those one-on-one meetings with your direct reports on a weekly basis. Weekly. You know, so you, yeah, absolutely every week. Come, come rain, hail or shine, you know, it's a it's a designated time slot and you're meeting one-on-one. Now, it doesn't have to be in the office. It could be out in the store. It could be out on site. It could be in a cafe. But, yeah, you know, and sometimes it had to be on the phone or Skype because of travel commitments. 
but you make that time with that individual and that individual knows that they've got your undivided attention for whatever time it is, and usually 45 minutes to an hour, and you discuss a whole host of things. Firstly, how, they go, how are they going personally? How are things at home? How are, things, you know, how are their children going? How are, the, how are their pets going? You know, it's, it's important to them. It should be important to you. Yep. You get that out of the way in the first five to ten minutes, and then say, "Okay, how, how you know what was your week like? What have you got this week? What are the, some of the challenges you've got? What can I do to take some of those barriers away and help you overcome those challenges? How can I support you? Because ultimately, you know, we talk about customer service. Customer service starts internally. Yep. You know, every, everyone you come into contact with within your organisation is your customer. Right, internal so, customers. Absolutely. So, so what are you doing? to not only meet their needs but but, but overwhelm them and, and, and exceed their expectations to really help them deliver because ultimately the ones that are on the coalface, they're the ones doing the delivery to the ultimate paying customer. Right, which is that whole piece we say everyone serves, everyone sells. And so what you're saying right there is you're, as a leader, you're serving your direct reports Absolutely. who in turn are serving their people who in turn are serving Absolutely. the customer. And you should you should be seeing yourself. You know, if you're if you are the leader of the organisation, and and subsequently, you, you, you know, you're, up, you're the rest of your leaders, your middle managers, everybody should be seeing themselves as the service provider. Uh, everyone to, serves to, everyone to, to, to their Absolutely. Um, you, you come back to those meetings. So one on one meetings on a weekly basis to go through the operational and, and any other issues, people issues, financial issues, etc. So it gives what it does. It gives them the confidence that they've got the support. It's uh, you're up to speed with what's going on in the organisation in, in, in every area. Uh, you don't need to understand the nitty gritty, but you're you're across things. You know when people are starting to struggle, and therefore you can use your experience, wisdom, uh, and expertise to to intervene and, and and support them before they probably even think they need the support. Yep. And, and there's a there's a there's a knack to that. The other thing is making sure that then you've got those monthly meetings, uh, those uh, monthly meetings where you've got everybody involved and everybody uh, uh, presents their, uh, you know, their key objectives and, and reports on their key objectives, so everybody can see how we're going. Lastly, on a on a quarterly basis, you know, I made sure that I got put in front of every single uh, store manager, um, some, in some way, shape, or form, and made sure that they were first of all acknowledged. And, and secondly, informed of what was going on, what was expected, because that's the other thing. You know, you've got to make sure you set the expectation of what you want people to achieve. Once you've done that a couple of times, people, uh, people, believe it or not, they really respond, and yeah. and they're in tune, and they're waiting for the next challenge. What? What are we doing next? When are we doing it? You said we we're going to do this. Well, you know, let's, let's get on with it. Fantastic, fantastic. And, and that's how you get your team fit. Is meeting cadence. So you talked about weekly one-on-ones. You talk about monthly as a group, and you've talked about the ninety-day meeting. So the, the 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 monthly as a group, you've got them, you've got all the direct reports together as a group, and the ninety-day meeting, you've got them together as a group as well. But also their direct reports. Oh, and their direct reports. Yeah, that's absolutely. A, that's a bigger meeting. That's a bigger meeting. Yeah. That's a that's a you know that's a that's a an update if you like a, a quarterly update. Right. And, and it's important that, you know, those people, those people that are on the cold face, the ones that are, that are dealing with the customers, they need to see you. They need to feel there's a connection. Yes. Because ultimately people don't work for organisations, people work for people. Yes, 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 yes. I'm just seeing, I love alliteration and you've talked here, I've talked, we've talked about meeting cadence, you've talked about connection, you've talked about uh uh, uh, challenge as well uh, when, when we're talking about commitment, people being involved so they get a sense of ownership, so they get a commitment, yeah? Absolutely. Absolutely. Beautiful. They, they, Beautiful. They, need, they need to feel engaged. And, and, and as you say, there's a slightly different agenda for each of those meetings. Of course, the one-to-one meetings are going to be different than the, than the monthly direct report meetings, which are going to be different than the 90-day everyone, everyone's there. But as you Absolutely. say, the, they're clear on expectations. They're clear on the challenges, and at the same time, you're. Uh, I imagine, as you say, uh, did you say the 90-day meeting in particular? You wanted to make sure that your direct reports were being acknowledged for the work they were doing. Absolutely, and 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 their people as well. So it's not about you know you getting up and, and about you and making and making a talk fest out of it. It's really about 
Um, you know, you've, you've basically got your whole organisation in front of you, except for the except for maybe the ones right at the coalface, because you know you can't get everybody together. Yep, yep. But then you can follow that up with a with a with a newsletter. You can follow it up with maybe a short video where you're giving all your staff an opportunity to uh, to hear what you've got to say. And if yep. you think that they don't want to hear what you've got to say, think again. You're the leader of the organisation. They very much want to know what you think and, uh, and and what your opinion is. And there's something about being close to you in terms of proximity. I mean, uh, I had a, a situation recently where uh, a chief exec um, was relatively new and one of the staff members said to me, the only time he talks to me is via email. Um, you know, it, it, I get the feeling he doesn't want to solve problems with me. He just wants to tell me stuff on email. And so you can imagine that person's commitment level and feeling of closeness to that chief exec was not that good at all. Yeah, look, uh, I've, in, in, I've got some, uh, some of my clients uh, have got, um, you know, key people in overseas, uh, in, in the US, uh, in the UK, and we've now set up scheduled weekly one-on-one Zoom meetings and all of a sudden the level of engagement has gone through the roof. Um, these people feel a lot more connected. I've, I've now been doing surveys with uh, with, with, with the you know, designated employees and they feel a lot more connected. They feel like they've got skin in the game and they're just a much ha- happier individual and performing more. You know, what yeah. I'm hearing is that, you know, they're, they're, they're adjusting to, um, you know, Australian timelines because they want to make sure that they're there when, they're, when their manager is, is there and they're working longer hours. Now, I'm not, I'm not, you know, espousing to, to working people to, to, to death. That's not healthy. But the fact that people want to give more when they feel they're engaged. Yep, yep. We call that that discretionary effort, as you say. Absolutely. When they're engaged, they find that extra 5 or 10%. But when they're not engaged, then they go, why, why bother? Uh, yeah, and, and as a leader, I think it's, it's critical that you remain relevant. Yeah. You know, yep. You've got to remain, when, when you're talking to people, have a look at, you know, who are you talking to? What are their roles? What's your expectation of them? Be relevant to them. You know, let's not, uh, let's not try and, uh, you know, make, turn this into rocket science because it really isn't. It's yeah, right. Playing. So give me, an example of, give me an example of being relevant. Um, I'll give you an example of being relevant very simply by um, let's, take a, let's take a, you know, I'll, I'll talk about retail because, because I've yep. done it for 40 years, right? So you want a, a particular store, and we're talking down at, at store level now. So we're talking shop, shop assistants, we're talking store managers, we're talking casual staff, in some cases 15, 16-year-old staff. Yep. And the challenge to them is I need your store to improve sales by 10%. Mm-hmm. That means absolutely nothing, yeah. you know, including the manager. That does not mean a lot of things, right? 10% of what? They don't even know, you know, do they know what their sales targets are? They probably don't. But if you said, look, let me tell you that every customer that comes in this shop, on average, spends $25 and they buy four items. Yep. So the average price of that item is about $5.50 or thereabouts, or $6, mm-hmm. sorry, $6, whatever it is, $25. What I need you to do, I need you to get each customer to spend $30 and buy seven items. How do you think you can do that? Now, you know what? That 16-year-old shop assistant is going to come up with probably five or six different ideas on how to do that. Yep. If you've got 10 of those shop assistants, there's 60 different ideas on how you're going to do that. Your yep. sales will, will improve overnight. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Give them, beautiful. Give them the expectation. Talk to them in, with relevance. They can relate to seven items. They can relate to to $5 item because they've yep. got $5 in their pocket. If you yep. say, I want you to get me, I want you to go from 1 million to 1.1 million, they can't relate to that. Right. See, Lee, I can't relate to that. <laughs> no, no, no. So that's a great example, as you say, of being relevant where you bring it down to what they can do in their world on a day-to-day, almost minute-by-minute basis. Take that to manufacturing. You know, take that to manufacturing. How long does it let people do this? You know, what if, what if you could do, instead of doing it in seven minutes, what, what if you could do it in six? What tools do you need? What, what can I do to help you get to six? Yep. Uh, and he goes, well, seven to six, that's pretty easy. I can do that. It's relevant. Yep. Yep. You say, yep. I want you to improve your productivity by 25%. It doesn't mean anything. 
Yeah, yeah, that's on the dashboard. That's which again comes back to um, part of the kaizen, the Japanese kaizen. They talk about gemba, which is go to where the work is actually done. And you and and you when when you're there, you start asking those kind of practical questions. Whereas when you're in the boardroom, you're just looking at spreadsheets and charts. That's 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 not relevant. It's not real world for the person who's actually there at the shop front or in the factory. Yeah, I, I call it managed by walking around. Yes. Yes. Okay. So get get around, you know, whether it's a factory, whether it's a, a service uh, industry, whether it's a you know cleaning industry, a, a waste management industry, get out there, have a look. What are the trucks doing? You know, how are they uh, how are they handling the bins? What are your customers saying? You know, yeah. just just get around and talk, and that's working on your business. Yeah. You know? And that's yeah. and that's the other thing I talk about is how much time as the CEO, the MD, or the GM. Are you spending working on your business rather than working in your business? Mm, mm, and, mm. And, and the answer to that is most people are spending anywhere between 85 and 90, 95% in their business. Yeah. And yeah. very, very little time on their business. Yeah, because they're, they're comfortable working in it because, uh, as Michael Gerber talked about, they're technicians, they're butcher bakers, plumbers, retailers, and they're happy in it versus if I want to grow it, I've got to work on it. Right. And in fact, as we say, if you're not actually working on it and growing it, then you're probably going backwards anyway. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. I, I, I love and, and, and the competition and the competition will, will sneak up behind you, and uh, before you know it, you'll get side you'll get side swipe. Yeah. So just on that, you at the at the CEO Institute, the recent summit, you were talking about the sigmoid curve. The, the the Professor Hardy's sigmoid curve. You just want to share a bit about what you teach people and how you use that in your coaching consulting practice. Um, okay, trying to do it on radio without a, without a whiteboard. Yes. But basically, sigmoid curve is uh, you know everything starts at the at, at the bottom of the axis. It then slowly uh, you know makes a trajectory to the to the upward uh, level and then starts to plateau. So what, yeah, it's um, like an, in, an inverted U, isn't it? It's a U, a U it's, it's like out. an S, if you like. It's like an it's like oh, yes, I well, see with the bell curve. So it starts yeah. off as an S, yeah. and then it starts to come down again, and then mm. it looks like a bell curve. And, mm. and away we go. We go through these cycles. You know, mm. everything's cyclical. You know, yeah. the environment's cyclical, the weather's cyclical, and so are businesses. What um what I try and uh, what I try and, and pass to, to to business owners and, and business managers is say. If you look at your history, you've had peaks and troughs. Mm. What if you could what if you could bypass the troughs and stay on the peak? Now, on your way up, that's the time that you need to be looking at new ideas. That's the time when you should be investing in new systems, processes, people, um, whatever it is that you know, part of your business strategy. Because that's the time where you've got cash flow, you've got confidence. Uh, you've got uh, you've got revenue and you've probably got profit. If you're trying to do it when you're on your way down, uh, it's it's conflicting because you're trying to reduce costs, you're trying to reduce waste, you're trying to uh, minimise uh, expenditure, uh, and therefore it's really hard to find that extra cash to try and do something new or something different. Right. Do it when you when you, when everything's good. Don't do it. Right. When, don't don't wait till you. Your backs to the wall, and then you've got no choice. Right, right, and you're in desperation states, which is a whole other, whole other ball game. So that's a great, that's a great explanation of it. That as you say, that's the perfect time is when things are going well. That's the time to say, let's look at the next level. Um, and and not that in the sigmoid curve says, from the time you come up with the new idea to the time it actually starts making money for you, there's a lag anyway. There's a lag, like, you know, absolutely. The time, time you plant the seed to the time you can harvest the wheat. There's a lag time, so you've got the cash and you've got the time when you when things are going well. Whereas, as you say, you, you wait till things are going bad. Now you're going to be going into debt over that lag time because you've you've put it off for too long. Yeah, unfortunately, it's counterintuitive because as human beings, we go, well, things are going great. You know, why yeah. why should I change? And, yeah. You know, we have an old adage that says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, I think that's got to go out the window. We've got to we've got to rephrase that. If it if it, if it isn't broken. Well, how can I improve it? Yeah. Right? So I've got a good base now because it's not broken. It's working. That's my core. That's my baseline. How can I make it better? Yeah. And, yeah. That's, what, and that's really what Sigmoid's Curve is about, is, is how can I improve on what I'm already doing? 
rather than, I'll oh, just leave it alone because it'll be all right. Well, it won't. The, yeah. you know, the world is changing at a much faster pace. You know, our, our industries are, uh, 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 morphing, they're changing, they're evolving very, very quickly. And we've got to try and find a way to stay ahead of the game if we want to survive. Yep, stay ahead of the game. I mean, as Jack Welsh from General Electric said, you know, if the rate of change inside the organisation is slower than the rate of change outside the organisation, you're going to be going backwards. And as you say now, technology, disruption, all of these things that are going on, uh, you've got to be just jumping so far ahead and 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 just constantly going, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? How do I evolve? How do I evolve? And which, it, which then makes communication even even more critical to ensure that you're keeping your people abreast of what's going on, so that so that they can you know they can deliver what it is that you're trying to achieve, and and they can remain engaged. Yep, and change, 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 the only constant. So from your point of view, uh, now, of course, you've worked in large organisations and now you're working for yourself as a consultant. What are some of the systems and rules you operate by on a daily and weekly basis for you to maximise your productivity and performance um, and, I suppose, working on your business as well? What are some of the rules and systems you use? One of the, one of the things that I that I do religiously, Lee, is, is I sit down before I actually finish for the day. Although yeah. although these days you sort of never finish, you know the phone's mm-hmm. always on, you're always mm-hmm. sort of you know trying. And I try I try and, and and not do that, you know. So at a given time in the evening, you know you, you put down your computer or you switch off your computer and, and try not to answer any more emails because I'm sure it can wait till the morning. And if mm-hmm. it's that urgent, someone will call you. But what I try and do is have a look at the next couple of days. What's what's ahead? What's uh, what's in front of me? What do I need to prepare for? And and if I'm across it a little bit more intimately, I can actually close that diary or close that uh, that Outlook calendar and, and and sleep well. Yep. Because because if I don't, I'm always thinking now. What have I got to do tomorrow morning? Oh dear, that's right. I've got that seven o'clock now. What, what's his name? What time? Um, hmm. What are we talking about? And your mind's going on hundred miles an hour. And of course, you're not getting a good sleep. You're actually not in the moment with your family or your friends or whatever it is that you're doing. Yep. And, and, and you know what? I, I see it all the time. People, you know, at dinner tables or, or out to dinner and they're on their phones, they're doing texting, they're doing emails. Mate, stop. Yeah. It, well, it's boundaries, isn't it? Setting morning. boundaries is to go to, hang on, that I've got to actually set, particularly when you're talking about home relationships or family relationships because then you're not present with the people coming back Correct. to you know, proximity being present with the people, you're actually half somewhere else and they feel that as well. But, of course, it comes down to boundaries and that, that then affects the quality of the relationship with your and wife. Equally, and equally at work, like, you know, you, you go into a meeting and all oh, of a yeah. sudden you're talking to someone and, and, they're, and they're answering a, a text or an email and, and you go, hang on a minute, stop, let's stop. This yeah. is our time, right? Yeah. So when you're having yeah. that one-on-one with your employee, this is our time. This yeah. is my dedicated time to you. Um, and equally, it's your dedicated time to me. So let's respect each other and 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 be in the moment because we're going to get so much more value out of it. Yeah, and, and, and absolutely. That's, and, that, and that's just one very simple tool. I think that we, we're we're losing, and it needs to. It's an opportunity to keep it sharp. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, in terms of your own ongoing learning and development, what do you what books are you reading, and what do you look at in terms of your own personal education? Because we say you know leaders are readers, but really leaders these days could be reading, listening, watching podcasts, <laughs> all sorts of different things. How do you keep uh, ahead of the game in terms of your own learning? Uh, I, I try not to try not to overwhelm myself with with too much information because it yeah. can be overwhelming, Lee. So yeah. I'm actually quite um, uh, particular about what I read. I, I, I try to um, I try to to keep relevant as a as a leader and, and as an individual. At the moment, I'm reading a couple of books or, or audio books, I should say. I'm listening to a couple of books. Yep. One is about the human species, which talks oh, yeah. about our ancestry and sheds light on why we behave the way we do, what drives and stimulates us as well as what, what demotivates us. Yep. And, and, and I think we're always learning about the human race. Um, you know, no two individuals are the same, mm. uh, but we, do, we certainly do have certain behavioural traits. And, and so I'm, I'm looking at that at the moment. It's, it's when, it back 70,000 years and it's working its way up to, to modern society. And let me just say that uh, 
the apple hasn't fallen far from the tree. You know, some of yeah. the things we've been doing 70,000 years ago, we still do it today, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. Is that um, the book Humans, or is that called The Human Species? It's called, um, it's called Sapien. Sapiens, some of you. I remember yeah. I, I saw a big – my mate had a white cover. That's uh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. called Sapiens. But yeah, you're, listening you're listening to it. You're listening to it. I'm listening to it. Sorry, I was saying reading. I'm listening to it. Um, the other one, uh, Lee, I'm listening to at the moment is called SPQR, and it's about the, the beginning of the Roman Empire. Okay. And, and then it's it's progression, you know, right up to uh, right up to the AD era. And, again, you know, it talks about civilizations. you know, how they went in and – how they 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 civilized and conquered and et cetera and their, their form of government and the way they related to each other and the structure and of course a lot of the structure that that, that we saw in the in the Roman era we, we, is still here today you know yep. the structure of government the way we communicate the terminology we use and again I, I find that very fascinating very interesting it's close to my heart because I'm, I am of that heritage um, and and so I I, I didn't realize how much influence it still has today, that, that civilization still has today and how much relevance it has. So I'm learning about that and and uh, sharing that, but also you know, putting what I'm learning into practice. Fantastic, mate, fantastic. Now, I'm just thinking as you're talking there also, um, how do you go about your marketing and lead generation, talking about staying ahead of the game? How do, you, how do people find out about you? But more to the point, what do you do systematically in terms of marketing and lead generation? I'll, I'll have to put my hand up, Lee, and probably say that's probably my weakest uh, my weakest point, and certainly an area for further development and opportunity. Um, yeah. I, I do use other people to help me with that because I like to surround myself with people that are good at things that I'm not good at, yep. or, or at least things that I don't like doing. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, we've all got those things, and uh, I, th- I learned very early in the piece that um, if you don't like doing something or you're no good at it, don't beat your head against the wall, find someone who isn't, surround yourself with those people. Yeah. yeah. Um, marketing, um, look, I, I, I use LinkedIn a, a, a bit. I've got a, I've got a website. Uh, I have people that, uh, that, that help me with, uh, with content. Um, but really, it's word of mouth. Yeah. Um, most, of my, most of my uh, business comes from referrals. And uh, the thing is, you know, we talk about servicing. I see servicing as, a, as, as you know, a... Uh, maybe a little bit different to others. Service is such a broad spectrum. I believe that providing good service is about understanding what the expectation is and delivering on that. Providing great service is about understanding what the expectation is and delivering above and beyond and making uh, the extra that much more relevant. I'll give you a very quick example. When you turn in at night in your hotel room and, and they provided a turn down service and left the chocolate or made an animal figure on your towel that's going that little bit extra, isn't it? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, sort of yeah. exceeding your expert. You weren't expecting that. You go, oh, wow, that's nice. Mm, mm. Now, now the trick is that you do that long enough, that becomes the norm. So then, therefore, that becomes the expect- expectation. So what are you going to do different next time to keep it relevant? Yep, yep, absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. No, no. Um, well, that's we, uh, customer service people often sometimes talk about the wow factor. People go, wow, that was nice. Wow, that was good. Um, but not the least of which is even just using someone's name, you know, yep. good to see you again, Mr. Farnell, or, you know, or uh, welcome back or it was, it was, all those little things just make make all the difference, don't they? And you see it. You see it in the airline industry. You know, they, they grab your boarding pass and they call you by name, both at check-in, both on the plane. And, and it is a nice touch. And I think we're getting better at it. Certainly overseas, they're a lot more in tune. Um, we're a little bit slow on the uptake. But I'm, I'm seeing it improve here in Australia, and uh, I think it helps when people have got name badges because then you can you can refer to the name and you can see their their face light up when you actually use their name. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, just on that, uh, who are your ideal clients? Who is the target client you you go after? The people you prefer to work to? What's their profile? Look, my ideal clients. Uh, there is a, there is really no ideal client. Rather, clients that are open to being challenged either themselves. Or, or their teams, or, or both, their, their organisations. People who want to simply improve their processes or way they're doing things. People used, you know, I said before, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, you know, if it ain't broke, how do we improve it? Mm. Um, so I've got clients in the mining industry. I've got miners, uh, clients in the um, entertainment, uh, acoustic engineering. Uh, what else? Uh, that, 
HR. Uh, so it, from broad spec engineering, uh, yep. a, a broad spectrum of, uh, of clients, Lee. As I said before, the skills are very transferable. Yeah. Um, the biggest issue I'm finding is is that many, not not just my clients, but many businesses out there. In fact, I'll quote: four out of five Australian small to medium businesses don't have a business plan. Yeah. Crazy, yeah. huh? It, well, crazy or not, um, what are we saying? That four out of five business owners are crazy? Um, wow. Why Why don't they have a business plan? I, I don't understand. So I'm trying to help people uh, understand the importance of it, the relevance of it, and then how that links to that to that ultimate engagement to get the best from your team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, literally, I was just doing some work with uh, an award-winning supermarket in Perth, and again, just by getting the team together every 90 days and setting a 90-day plan, what they've seen is, one, everyone's on the same page. Two, they've got some markers to work against and toward to improve. And they're saying, Lee, the thing, the thing that's happened, you know, we've had such a great improvement in performance in both the what we're stocking on the shelves, what's selling, the teamwork. There's all sorts of, like, tangible and intangible benefits of getting together, forming a plan, and then saying, well, let's, let's see how close we can come to hitting that plan or even exceeding it. Uh, it's amazing what happens when you get a team of people working off the same page, doesn't it? Well, absolutely. And, and it'd be interesting if we did a, 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 a satisfaction survey of those people, you know, before you started and then, and then after a couple of 90-day periods, you know, maybe after 180 days, what is the sentiment? What is the feeling? And, I, and I'll, you know, I'll bet London to a brick that it would have exponentially improved. Yeah. And, and equally, there may have been people who didn't quite fit and maybe aren't there anymore. Yeah. And so by default, the team's actually stronger. Yes, you 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 haven't even had to shoot the the, uh, no. the what, what we call what was it we, the, ca- carry, carry the wounded and shoot the stragglers. Yeah, the, so the stragglers often self-select. They go, gee, the heat's just gone up. I don't want to be part of this. Or there's going to be a higher level of accountability. I'm jumping ship here. So um, the, just the planning process in itself sorts a bit of wheat from the chaff. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Lee. And don't underestimate the good feeling that the rest of the employees get out of that. Because all yes. of a sudden they go, all the, I, you know, I'm the one doing all the hard yards. I'm the one that's, you know, that's that's doing the right thing. As mm. are my, some of the, my colleagues, we're now being rewarded simply by not accepting that poor behaviour or that that you know that straggler mentality. Yep, yep. But literally, I was just sent a text to one of my clients the other uh, two days ago having drama they've uh, sacked a, 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 a person on the team and invariably I've said a thousand hundred times what we've seen time and time again when you have a suspicion that the person's not doing the right thing and you finally 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 let them go I said it's like a wisdom tooth you realize the rot and the black hole was way bigger than you thought and you go what the and I said mate at the end of the day you're the business owner, you have to take 110% responsibility for that. Your business is a reflection of you. Don't want to, you know, this is hard. It, it happened on your watch. So now uh, your job is to turn the negative to a positive. It's like as Napoleon Hill said, you know, in every uh, adversity lies the seed of equal or greater advantage. So now out of this dark spot, now this guy's in like legal battles with this, with this person he's let go because he's trying to say I was fantastic. And, of course, there's a whole lot of evidence to say they weren't. But now there's a big blue and all this drama, which is a major distraction, rather than if he had have been, in your, as you say, doing weekly meetings, monthly meetings, 90-day, you know, had a cadence of some kind of both coaching and support but also accountability, it wouldn't have got to this stage. Yeah, look, I, you're, you're right once again, Lee. I challenge leaders to reflect you know, during their during their their business and and their career, how many people have you actually fired, and how many pe- people actually left of their own accord? Okay, yep. so I, I'd like to I, I like to believe, well, I know for a fact that I've fired less people than people have, have chosen to to move on. Yeah, and why have they chosen to move on? Exactly those things you said. You know, all of a sudden they're accountable. There's the, the heat's on. There's an expectation that they're going to meet certain certain timelines and certain uh, certain uh, you know productivity markers and when they feel they can't do it they self-select yeah 
Yeah, and, yeah. And ideally, that's what you want to do. But that, but that, that needs to be quick. That needs to be, you know, a, a, a four to six week time frame, not a four to six month time frame, or or, or longer, as as we as we continually see in some businesses. And as you say, what happens is for all those employees and team members that are p- playing the game well, for every day that that someone is struggling and not carrying their weight and management doesn't do something, uh, they start to question, what am I doing here? This is this is B grade and C grade, not A grade. And manage and I've got and I've got B grade and C grade managers leading the place. I don't want to be around B graders and C graders. Um, so it really You does. end up losing the good ones as well. Yeah, yeah, the good ones go, mate. I want to play with A graders, uh, and so that that which is again part of the role of leadership and management is uh, maintaining the standards and reminding people this is the standard we're playing the game at here. Which of course then means the leader manager needs to play the game at that. There's a whole responsibility around the leader manager uh, holding themselves to higher standards as well, isn't it? And, and sporting, you know, you, you, we're making reference to sporting teams now by A grade and B grade, and yeah. and you know, sporting teams are really good at this, particularly the really really top professional ones. You know, they support good players who who play hard when they're injured, when they're maybe struggling to form, but they exit players that just don't have the heart. You know, and they're not in there with the heart. They're not the team player. They don't have that spirit. They exit them very, very quickly. And we've yep. seen what happens when clubs or teams don't do that. Oh, they, yeah. they, they, they nurture a, a toxic culture, a, to- a culture of, uh, you know, um, uh, people just being complacent, a culture of complacency and, and poor performance. Yeah, so people are there for the paycheck. If you want to create a winning culture, you've got to be at the top of your A, a-, a-, a game, as you said. And make sure that uh, you've only got 18 players. Anyone who wants to be a B team player, well, they either go and sit in the reserves or they go and play somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, I recently, um, well, you know, you, I'm thinking. Firstly, you got Justin Langer of what he's done with the Australian cricket team, and and of course before that with the West Australian cricket team, uh, in terms of changing the culture, setting higher standards, uh, you know, focusing on what are we proud of from the past that we want to maintain, and at the same time, how do we need to behave moving into the future. Um, so it's almost like culture first, then let's look at strategy and tactics because, in fact, I think Peter Drucker said, you know, culture will eat strategy for breakfast any day. Um, that Setting, nurturing that culture, what are the standards, how do we want to be thinking and behaving and relating around here? Um, and then so Justin Langer with the Australian cricket team, let alone I was watching some uh, video clips of Michael Jordan and, of course, Kobe Bryant had, pa- had passed away recently. The standards that Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant set uh, uh, with other members of the team, like if, if they felt others were not playing A grade or, you know, the best, then they should certainly let them know. At the same time, they were supportive, but it's like, no, if you're not going to put in at A grade level, then, mate, you're going to you're going to find yourself not around here. Um, so so we, that's the other thing about teams as to how you can set it up so that they're self-managing, so that the team and the team members are holding each other accountable. They don't wait till the boss is around. Otherwise, it, they only perform when the boss is around, and then they drift drift back to B grade and C grade when the boss isn't there. Yeah, I mean, dashboards are a good a good tool, and and those monthly meetings when when you have to stand up and you have to report on what you've achieved. Based on your uh, on your targets. Yeah. Now I've got to tell you, you know, it, it ain't it ain't fun sitting in front of a group of peers saying I didn't meet my targets and uh, I didn't achieve what I said I was going to do. Yeah. It's okay to do it once. You might get away with it twice. I don't know that I want to be sitting in the meeting on the third occasion. Yeah, yeah. That peer group peer group accountability is just is massive, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But but you'll find that if people are struggling in those environments, if you've got a good culture, people will say, look, I can see you're struggling with that. Let's take this offline. I want, to, I want to try and help you because yeah. if I help you, it's going to help me. Yeah, it's going karma. to help my department or my uh, category or my clients. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. brilliant. Henry, there's so much we've covered today, not the least of which is there. We're talking about culture, meetings, communication, uh, proximity at the same time, uh, standards, uh, holding people accountable, having those one-to-one chats. There's so many good things there. Mate, if people want, of course, Sigmoid Curve, we talked about disrupting your own business and working on the business, not just in it. How do people get hold of you, mate, if they want to find out more about your coaching consultancy? Yeah, studies? certainly. Uh, look, LinkedIn, uh, I've got a, a website, Provectus, uh, and Provectus Management Consulting. Send me an email, you know, drop me a line, whatever. Um, I've got my phone number on, the, you know, on all the all the necessary uh, social media 
outlets. So probably LinkedIn is probably the best uh, the best way to have a look at my profile. And look, I'm just happy to have a chat and, and you know, no obligation. If I can help and there's some synergy, fantastic. If not, maybe I can put you in the right track with someone else in my network that, uh, that can help because that's what it's all about. Ultimately, we want to see, you know, West Australian businesses, Australian businesses succeed. We want to see business leaders succeed. Everybody wins. We make a bigger pie. And everybody gets a, gets a share of that pie. Rather exactly. than try and take at your share of the pie, make your share of the pie bigger, how do we grow the whole pie so that we all eat? That's the, that's the win-win mentality. Mate, we're on the same page there. As, as I, I like the George Clayson quote, our prosperity as a nation is determined by our individual prosperity, but how do we help each other prosper, which is why I use the term self-serve prosper. How do we help ev- each other prosper and in, and in so doing the whole place, Australia, the country, Absolutely. prospers more? Yeah. Thanks so much, Henry. Uh, and I'll put your contact details in the in the blog and the post as we move forward. And obviously, I'll get you a copy of this as well. Mate, thanks always so much for your time. Always a pleasure, Lee. Thank you for the opportunity. We'll catch up soon, no doubt. Thanks, Henry. All the best. Take care. Bye-bye. Prosper.com, the start of your sales transformation. Well, didn't you get a lot out of that interview? Henry talks so much about meeting cadence, communication, challenging, um, holding people accountable, uh, what we do with the wounded uh, versus what we do with the stragglers, um, cash flow, uh, building confidence, communication. It's all in there. Take advantage of it. Build it into your systems and watch your business grow, working on the business, not just in it. And of course, planning to work on the business. Want some help with it? Then touch base with me or most importantly, do our online free diagnostic. We're getting so much great traction where businesses spend 10 minutes doing the diagnostic. We call it the business opportunity finder diagnostic, where the opportunities are to create a breakthrough in your business. It really is a fantastic tool. So go online, take advantage of it, and then we can touch base if you want to, and we can show you exactly where those levers of change are in your business. It's something you really should do today to make a difference, to commit to a breakthrough. Take advantage of it. Go for it. See you soon.